Jesus, you're so good. How we love you, Lord. Sing with us. Higher than the mountains that I face. You're stronger than the power of the grave. Constant in the trial and the change, this one thing remains singular. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love, your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Here we go. Would you move in us? Would you speak to us? Would you bring transformation tonight, Jesus? We lift our eyes to you. We are your church. We are your sons and daughters. We've gathered here to meet you.
Coast Hills, it is great to see you. It's our second summer hours, and look at you guys. You're here. So thankful. My name's Chet. I'm the lead pastor here, uh, and glad that you guys are here. Hey, listen, if you're sitting back there behind that you can't see, we can move those things out of the way so that we can make sure that you can see. Yeah, I'm pointing you out. Sorry, I didn't mean to, but uh, you guys look so wonderful. I want to make sure I can see you, right? Um, Hey, listen, we got a couple of announcements. The first one's a video announcement. Would you take a look at the screen and then I'll talk about it in just a minute. Can you look at all the different sights you see? This is right now, you just listen. You hear nothing but the birds. Well, it's Jorge and Carolyn from the Jordan River. We just got baptized, and Jesus was the one that said, Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we wanted to be obedient here today. This is another one of those rare places where you know for sure that Jesus walked. I've been a Christian for 40 some years and to actually come here is like a lifetime dream. To actually see the place where Jesus walked, it'll just all come and seem so real because you've actually seen the place where it happened. Matter of fact, I plan on staying. Matter of fact, I'm going to take my backpack up and I'm move right down to the end right here. So y'all come to my fish shop, I'm going to be right here. The Lord's going to set up his throne, and there is going to be a river of living water that is going to flow from Jerusalem down into the Dead Sea, and the waters are going to be healed, and the fishermen are going to fish in that sea. Describe the visit itself in you know, words that we say really aren't enough. A, a tour of Israel makes the Bible come alive in a whole new way. So I would certainly encourage people to come. So we are excited to let you know there are two upcoming trips to Israel. The first one is in 2018, and it is for young adults. And so it's going... <laughs> yes, a young adult Israel trip. Uh, and then we have another trip that's going in 2019, and that's going to be church-wide for um, our church as well. We'll be connecting with uh, Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa along with a few other churches, uh, and we're looking forward to that trip. And so you'll be hearing more about that 2018 young adult, 2019 church-wide trip. We also want to let you guys know we are doing a book of the month here at Coast Hills, and the book of the month will always coincide with what's going on from the pulpit. And so because we're teaching the Gospel of Mark about being a servant, we have uh, available for you, if you'd like to get one, uh, Warren Wiersbe's book on being a servant of God. And basically what this does is supplement what's happening from the pulpit. We want to make disciples, and so we're providing an opportunity for you to continue to grow. As well, I'm excited, June 30th, uh, Marriage Matters will be hosting a catch-up and check-up event from 7 to 8.30. So there's going to be light snacks and there's going to be worship and the Word of God my wife and I will be sharing. We're super stoked about it. Um, and it's an opportunity for you husbands to take your wife out for dinner and then show up here about quarter to seven and then we'll have a great time together. You'll meet a new friend and then you go for dessert with them afterwards. And so this is how it happens here at Coast Hills and how you get to know 
people. But as well, uh, we want to let you know about June 25th. Now, that's right. June 25th. Now, keep that date in your mind. Christmas in June. Christmas in June, okay? June 25th, we're going to be celebrating, and we want you to wear your tackiest Christmas a parable, a, par a parable. I'll be talking about a parable tonight, but I want you to wear tacky Christmas apparel. And uh, Matt Kern, one of our elders, he got me the ugliest sweater that you could possibly imagine for Christmas. I'll be wearing it to big old Rudolph, and I'm sure that you will love it. Uh, but I want you guys to wear your tacky Christmas apparel. And listen, ladies or gentlemen, we want you to bring your favorite Christmas cookies that you make in your house that I can eat. So here's the deal. Christmas in June, June 25th, so we want you guys to be able to uh, come and be a part of that, but we're also adding something to it. You see, we are beginning our uh, ministry arc, actively reaching kids this coming September, and we're going to be hosting hundreds of inner city kids and at-risk at -risk kids at the Green Valley Christian Camp, but one of the needs that they all have is bedding. And so, on top of our Christmas in June, we're going to challenge our body for a sleeping bag drive. And there's sleeping bags at Target or Walmart, $20 or under. Don't come with like, you know, the hoodie that's rated zero and, you know, it's like $300. That's not the one we want. You can use that $300 and buy several sleeping bags. But what we want to do is be able to give all of our kids a sleeping bag to be able to be up at the camp up at Big Bear, but then as well to take that sleeping bag home as a memory of their event uh, that we were able to host for them up on the mountain. And so that's on June 25th, June 25th. So why don't we go to the Lord in prayer, commit these things to him, and ask him to bless our time. Our Father, we are grateful that we can be here in this country and that we can worship you. And Savior, we're thankful for this evening. A new service, a new time, a new opportunity. And our prayer is that you would bless this service. We pray, Jesus, that you would just grant unto us a time where our heart connects with yours. But I know, Lord, there's some sitting in front of me that they have come tonight with requests. They've come with concerns. They've come with the need, and they're praying. And you've asked us to lift up holy hands. And so if you have a prayer request, something experience that you're walking through or situation, you need help from God, would you just raise your hand and say, yep, pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? Amen. Just keep your hands raised. Lord, we lift up to you every holy hand that's in surrender saying, I need you. And my prayer, Lord, is that you would hear their prayer. Father, I ask that you would meet their request. And my prayer, Lord Jesus, is that you would answer them quickly. I pray for that situation. I pray for that circumstance, that marriage, that child or that grandchild. Lord, would you just move mightily with their request even now? In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite our ushers forward and as we prepare to take our offering tonight um, I'm hopeful that tonight we can enter into the space of remembrance of why we're here and why we took time out of our evening even more different than usual but why we took time to come here um, whose presence we are expecting whose presence we're in right now so I pray that um, even as we take our offering that we would take a moment to remember the God who is here, the real God that he is, everything that he encompasses. So even if you take a second, remember, why did you show up tonight? And who is here waiting for you? Oh, and I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I tender whisper of love in the dead of night and day me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, 
Tell him he's perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. Lord, you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. You're a good. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Would you remain standing as we honor God and his word? Tonight we will be in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. The text will be above me on the screen. Revelation chapter 19, if you're in your Bibles, verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. 
on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, how great and glorious that day will be, our Father. When your Son comes in all of his glory, and we have the opportunity, Lord, as the church, to join with him in that final day. And so I pray now that as we study your word, would you speak to us? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take your seat? At the same time, would you look at the big screen? How many of you wish, after reading those headlines, that Revelation 19 would happen right now? So we say, come, Jesus, come. Man, I was hoping right now at that moment, you know, we'd all be gone. But then, would some of you be left behind? You see, there is a truth. It's the title of our message, The Coming King. The Coming King. He is coming back. Whether you choose to agree with that or not, Jesus said that he will come back. We read in Revelation chapter 19, he's coming back on a white horse. And there, as he comes back on his leg, listen, parents, is tattooed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God is into tattoos. Kind of cool, I thought, as a little side note. Now, some of the parents are going, I can't believe you just said that. It's right there. I didn't read it. It's Revelation chapter 19, right on his leg, is King of Kings and Lord of Lords as he comes riding this white horse with the church following behind him. You see, I have to read that text in order for us to engage and understand our study that we find ourselves in Mark chapter 13. In Mark chapter 13, if you want to go ahead and turn there, as well as first, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3, Mark chapter 13, 2 Peter chapter 3, you see, This understanding that we have a coming king is exactly what Mark chapter 13 is about. But before we engage there, we've got to understand where the disciples are at. You see, in Mark chapter 12, Jesus has hit it out of the park. He has won the spiritual Super Bowl. He has come out of the stadium with the Super Bowl ring on. And though the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, were against Jesus, Jesus had the victory. Though they asked him all kinds of questions, questioning his authority, Jesus was able to knock it out of the park. And the disciples are feeling a little bit like they're on the winning team. The disciples are feeling a little bit, well, imagine if your team won the Super Bowl and you've got the jersey on, you're not coming out walking like this. No, you're shouting and you're screaming because you're stoked about being on the winning team. That's exactly where the disciples are at in Mark chapter 13. Would you look with me at verse 1? And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, look, teacher, What wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Man, we're on the winning team, Jesus. And they're looking at this incredible temple that King Herod had built. And they're just overwhelmed with this incredible experience. And they go, Jesus, would you look at this building? Now, I want to fill in the the paraphrase that should probably be here. Because what they're really saying is this. 
Jesus, now that you've shown yourself to be the authority, we know that one day we will be ruling this Temple Mount. And so because we know that we will be ruling this Temple Mount, how incredible is this building? James and John are arguing which one will have the office with the window. One of them is probably saying, well, I'm going to be right here and collect all the money. It was probably Matthew. You see, they're thinking something when they're looking at this building saying, we're on the winning side, and thank goodness they called him teacher. Because that's exactly what Jesus is going to do in his response. Would you look at verse 2 and how he says and responds, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Not exactly the answer the disciples were looking for. Let me tell you something about chapter 13. I got some good news and I got some bad news. Now, here's the good news. Jesus is coming back, and Mark's going to let us know that. Um, I don't know if you heard me. Jesus is coming back. Okay. All right, you guys, it's 530. We can kind of have fun with this, okay? All right. Jesus is coming back, all right? Good news. Jesus is coming back. All right. Thank you, Michael. You know, someone's excited about Jesus. Oh, Colin, God bless you. Someone's excited about Jesus coming back. That's the good news of Mark chapter 13. But I got some bad news. If you thought those headlines were bad, wait till you see the headlines in Mark's Gospel, chapter 13. If you think that's rough, wait till you see during this period of time, known as the tribulation, the headlines that are going to be on CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and every major network that's out there. It's unbelievable. It's some bad news. Now, let me tell you something. Mark chapter 13, it's known as the Olivet Discourse. That's what theologians have come up with, this big, fancy, holy word, the Olivet Discourse, because it takes place on the Mount of Olives. Look at verse 3. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple... Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? You see, this takes place on the Mount of Olives, and so we as theologians, we come up with this fancy word, we call it the Olivet Discourse. Now, this is the longest teaching that Mark has recorded. Out of all of the teachings of Jesus, he takes time to accentuate this particular teaching in over 36 verses to help us understand something very important. And the very important thing is the good news that I told you, that Jesus is coming back. Now, you've got to remember, Mark and Peter are in the middle of Rome, and they're under persecution. And there's nothing more hope-filled for someone than to know that your Savior is going to come back and rescue you from this persecution. No wonder Jesus so wise, so wise, in Acts chapter 1, when the disciples asked him, are you going to set up the kingdom now? You know what his response was? It's not for you to know. Now, the reason why I think that's so wise, can you imagine if Jesus said, well, hey, guys, Um, it's going to be about 2,000 years before I even think about coming back. Imagine the disciples sitting there listening to what they would have to now know in 2017 that Jesus is still waiting to come back. Now, I know, listen carefully, I'm glad he waited a few years so that I got saved in the process. And I'm really thankful that he didn't come before I came to know Christ because then, well, well, you don't want to be here during this period of time. And so Mark, he takes the time to let us know there's hope. Jesus is coming back. Now, it's so important the way that Mark set this up. Because we have to know, do you really know the future? Jesus, do you, are you really a prophet? Can you really tell us what's ahead? Now, I know you're the authority, Jesus, but I need to know, can you tell us what's going to happen in the future? Are you truly a prophet? And so Jesus prophesies, and he says there in chapter 13, verse 2, do you see these great buildings? There will not be one left, uh, excuse me, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Well, the disciples are coming out of the building, they're going, Look at this incredible building. And let me tell you how incredible it was. Look at the screen. This building was magnificent. So magnificent 
that Josephus, the Jewish historian, he writes that the marble that Herod used to build the building with made Mount Zion look like a mountain of snow. So white, so beautiful, and so incredibly colorful that when the morning sun would hit the temple, there was so much gold, it reflected the sun that Josephus tells us that this looked like a reflection radiating out the sun from the top of Mount Zion. It was beautiful. It was spectacular. It took over 80 years to build. King Herod, he, he wasn't really the king of the Jews. He tried to win them over. So he poured so much money, so much energy, so much effort, in fact, just to build the Holy of Holies. It is recorded that 10,000 workers worked on the Holy of Holies in King Herod's temple. This is how much effort and energy he put in it. What a shame that only seven years after it was completed, what Jesus said would happen actually happened. In fact, Jesus said it would happen three other times. In Luke chapter 19, you can look it up later, Jesus says, your enemy is going to come against you, he's going to build earth right up to the temple mountain, and he's going to batter the doors down. And do you know that's exactly what Vespasian and Titus did? They came right into Jerusalem. They sat on the Mount of Olives. They were there contemplating how to get in. And they built a battering ramp and took their battering ramps all the way up to the doors and bro uh, brought the doors down. And that day, over 600,000 Jews died in Rome. Understand? Luke chapter 23, Jesus made it very clear that there would be absolute destruction of the temple. There would not be one stone on top of the other. You see, when the Romans came in, because there was so much gold on the temple, they took apart every single brick so that they could get the gold that was inside the mortars. They devastated the building so much that there was not a stone to be found on Temple Mount. You see, Jesus is a prophet. He did communicate exactly, listen, what Ezekiel the prophet would prophesy 600 years before. And listen, I want you to write it down in your notes. It's Ezekiel chapter 21. And there in Ezekiel chapter 21, Ezekiel would detail not only how, but who and when the temple would come down. And Jesus is reiterating this, that he would communicate now and say not one stone will be there. And exactly what Jesus said would happen, happened on August 29th, 70 A.D. August 29th, 70 A.D. Now the amazing thing about this particular date, August 29th, it was on August 29th that the first temple was destroyed by the Jews 600, excuse me, destroyed by the Babylonians 600 years prior. On August 29th, the Babylonian temp destroyed the first temple. And on August 29th, the Romans destroyed the second temple. And as if God in his divinity is communicating, I'm in control. Now this temple, the disciples, they're walking out and they're seeing the beauty of this temple. And they're listening to what Jesus is saying. They're not going to see the destruction at this particular point. No, but something cued in their mind. Something cute in their mind. Because in Ezekiel chapter 40, you can write it down, Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, Ezekiel tells us that there needs to be a third temple. And when this third temple is rebuilt, the Messiah is going to rule the world. The Messiah is going to set up his kingdom. And as soon as Jesus said, this second temple is going to be destroyed, the disciples went, oh, he's going to set up the new kingdom. He's going to build the third temple. Matthew's going to go, I'm going to be the chief tax collector. James and John start fighting about who's going to sit at the right and the left. Peter gets mad at him and he starts beating him up. I mean, we've got this major colossal thing going on in the disciples where they come together with Jesus, just a certain select of them, and they say this, now when is this going to happen, Jesus? And can you tell us the signs so that we can be ready for it? We want to get our special official robes so that we can walk into the temple and look really cool, Jesus. So tell us when it's going to happen. So uh, the thing about Jesus is um, he never really answers wrong questions. 
he never really responds to the wrong question. And this is exactly what's happening with the disciples. They're asking the wrong question. So Jesus, he doesn't answer wrong questions. He only answers the right one. And the reason we know that they had asked the wrong question, Peter lets us know many years later because he finally gets the right question to ask. Would you go with me to 2 Peter? 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read verse 11. Listen to this. Peter finally got it. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved. In other words, there is going to be a tribulation and the end of the world is going to come. So since these things are going to be dissolved, listen to the question. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? There's the right question. Not when and what. But what kind of person am I supposed to be knowing that Jesus Christ is coming? Now, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ is coming again? Would you raise your hand? Okay, so this question then comes to us. What kind of person should we be in holiness? And what kind of person should we be in godliness? Well, we're going to study that because that's the question that Mark is going to answer. Jesus is going to answer for us and Mark is going to record. It's two points tonight. Listen, the first, we need to be watching, watching in holiness. And we need to be working, working with godliness. Two points tonight. Watching with holiness and working with godliness godliness but before we go into chapter 13 you need to know something chapter 13 is known as the little apocalypse i don't know if you knew that and if you're spanish you would call it apocalito it's just a little little apocalypse about the book of revelation now let me communicate something to you the entire book of revelation is summarized in matthew 13 The entire book is summarized in Matthew 13. So we need to understand the book of Revelation. Well, some of you go, wait a second. You're going to teach us the book of Revelation? Yep, take a look at the screen. So let's let's become students just for a moment, and let's understand exactly what Jesus is going to be communicating in Mark's Gospel, chapter 13. So here we have the age of the world. We are currently living, left-hand side of the screen, in the church age. This is the opportunity for you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. He's beckoning you. He's calling you. His Spirit is wanting to, for you to come to Christ. We know this as the church age. We know this as the age of grace. In this church age, something incredible is going to happen with the church. We're going to be raptured. Now, if you're alive... You're just going to be caught up in the air and the corruptible of your body is going to become incorruptible and those that are dead in Christ, they will rise first and we will meet Jesus in the air. And so the rapture is going to happen in this church age. Now after the rapture, there's an event called the tribulation. Now take a look at Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13, and look at Jesus' answer. See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, verse 6, saying, underline this, I am he, and they will lead many astray. There's an event that is going to happen that Daniel chapter 9 tells us. And when this event happens, the seven-year timeline begins for the tribulation. And that event is this. There will be a man who sets himself up as the world power. We know him as the Antichrist. Now let me tell you something. He's a good-looking, military, economic, political genius. He's not a guy that goes, that's not the Antichrist, okay? Anti means counterfeit. He's going to look a lot like Jesus. And some people will be confused by his look. 
And so this guy is going to come on the world scene. He's going to rise out of nowhere, kind of like how Obama went from a little sh a Chicago committee member to the president of the United States. Kind of like, well, the prime minister of France who came from nowhere and now he's the prime minister. This is the spirit of the Antichrist preparing us for this moment. Let me explain. 50 years ago, just 50 years ago, we never would have elected a president that hadn't served in the military or given some kind of long-term political service. Now, we elect everybody and anybody. It's just the preparation. And so, when that peace treaty is signed with Israel, that initiates seven years. Now, take a look at the screen. In that seven-year period, there are two sections. In the gray section here on the left is three and a half years. Then you'll see a red sec or a black section there, another three and a half years. This first three and a half years is known as the tribulation. The second portion is known as the great tribulation. So let's go through it together. Three and a half years. What is the first one known as? It's known as tribulation in the Bible. Now, the second three and a half years is known as the great tribulation. And this period of time is seven full years. Now here's what happens. There are seal judgments, trumpet judgments, and bowl judgments. Let me describe. Back in this day, when a king wanted to write a letter, he would put his authority on the letter with a seal. And no one broke that seal. If you broke that seal as a servant, it could cost you your life. And what that seal says is that you are the authority. And so what the seal judgments are is a declaration every time that Jesus breaks one, I am the authority. I am the authority. And these judgments fall on the earth. Then we have the trumpet judgments. Well, a trumpet would announce the coming of a king. And these trumpet judgments are the announcement, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. You need to get prepared. And the bowl judgments? Oh, man. You don't want to be here for the bowl judgments, okay? If you think like you read the Left Behind series and you're like, ooh, I like espionage, this is really cool, trust me, you don't want 100-pound hailstones falling on your head. It's going to hurt, okay? These bowl judgments, let me communicate. When we lived in Liberia, we would wash our feet in a bucket of water. That bucket of water at the end of the day was nasty, okay? Nasty feet, nasty water. And what we would do is we would swirl that water so that all the dirt would go into the water and not rest in the bucket. And then we would take the water with all the swirling dirt in it and throw it out into the street so that the dirty water went from the bowl all onto the street. And that is the bowl judgments. It's the complete wrath of God swirled around over time and given back to man. For example, all of the waters turn to blood, but the world has martyred and killed Christians and have sought their blood. And God responds and he says, swirling in his bowl, if it's blood that you want, here is blood. There are people that worship the stars. And God says in his bowl judgments, if you want to worship the stars, then here they are. And they're cast down on the earth. God is just. And so he responds in a way that is just. But every one of these judgments is him beckoning to man. I love you. I'm trying to let you know the world is coming to an end. And you need me. You need salvation. Now listen, church, got good news. You can receive him today and not have to go through any of this, okay? Seven years of tribulation, two periods, three and a half years, and three and a half years. This is the tribulation. And look what he says here in verse 7. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. That's seal number two. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes, number three, in various places. There will be famines, number four. There are but the beginning of birth pains. Look what he says in verse 9, but be on your guard. Right there we have Revelations chapter 6 and 7, the seal judgments right there summarized for us. And Jesus is saying, be on your guard. It's our first point. Be watchful with holiness. 
be watchful with holiness. Because I've got to tell you something. We have an enemy. And the Bible says that our enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I want to tell you something. You know what his tactics are? Lies and deceit. And you know where they start? It's a five-year-old girl in kindergarten. And a five-year-old boy walks up to her and goes, you're fat. And for the rest of that girl's life, the enemy breathes that lie into her. So much so when she turns 16, she's still believing the lie. And now she's anorexic and struggling because she thinks because of that lie that was poured into her, now she's just, well, she's not even good looking. And she believes the lie and the beauty of Jesus. He speaks truth. And truth is you're mine. Truth is I love you. Truth is I make all things beautiful. Truth is sets you free, and Jesus communicates, and he communicates in truth because he wants to set us free. But the enemy lies to us. And so he says, be watchful. But I want you to be watchful with holiness. I don't want you to be watchful watching your way. No, I want you to be watching my way, and I need to give you one of the great, incredible, powerful promises of Scripture. Listen to this. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. And when I'm done, I want you to shout amen, okay? All those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Some of you are like, nope, not doing that one. (laughs) That's a promise of God. All of us who want to live a godly life, if we want to choose to be watchful with holiness, the enemy is going to persecute us. And take a look at the kind of persecution in verse 9. For they will deliver you over to councils. You'll be beaten in synagogues. You'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. In other words, what he's saying is, despite all of those things that you go through, the gospel must be first in your life. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, don't be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now imagine, most of the Christians at this time, they could not read or write. And they're going to stand in front of a king? Jesus, what are you saying? He says, don't worry about it. I got it covered. My spirit is going to supernaturally give you the words to say. And look what he says in verse 12. Brother will deliver brother over to death. Father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have put them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Do you hear the kind of persecution for living a godly life? Listen to what he's saying. There's going to be religious persecution. How many articles do we need to read about ISIS in Syria and Iraq? going into Christian villages and hanging children from a cross simply because they believe in Jesus. There's going to be religious persecution. There's going to be political persecution. I was not surprised on Friday when Bernie Sanders attacked Russell Vogt simply because he's a Christian. We're on our way. Listen, family... I was in the Middle East two years ago. And there was a girl, 17 years old. She decided, I want to come to Jesus. She went home to tell her family. And you know the response of her family? They stripped her naked and threw her out into the street. And in that country, it was a death sentence. Persecution? Jesus told us it was going to happen. Now, you guys, listen. I warned you. I told you there'd be some bad news. I told you. I prepared. I said there's good news and there's bad news. We're still in the bad news part. We're still in the middle of that seven-year tribulation. We're still in the first three and a half years. And he's telling us there's going to be persecution. He told us in Revelation by breaking the fifth seal that the martyrs say, How long, O God? And he says, Wait until the time. There is going to be persecution. Now, I need to give you a heavenly perspective of persecution. Let me tell you what Jesus said about persecution. You're not going to like this one. Okay, listen. Blessed are you. Blessed. Now, that word means happy. 
Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of evil things against you. Listen to what Jesus said. You should be happy when you're persecuted. Put a big smile on your face and say, I'm suffering for Jesus. Can someone say amen? Didn't sound too positive. Okay, you didn't sound way too convinced. Trust me, I struggle with that one too. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Jesus had such a different perspective. Now, I don't know if his words made you feel any better, but you need to hold on your seat because it's about to get worse. I'm telling you, you guys, you don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. You want to receive Jesus now because as we move into the second three and a half year period, it only gets worse. But I got good news. I'm going to tell you how to get out of it. I'm going to tell you how to escape it because Jesus has given us a way. There in verse 14, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Remember, Mark was writing to a Roman audience. So he said, let the reader understand. In other words, I know you don't know what this means, so you're going to have to do a little bit of research because I don't have the time to tell you about the prophecy in Daniel. You see, if I go to the middle of Africa and I say on July 4th, let's celebrate July 4th. How exciting. Then they go, what's exciting about July 4th? What do you mean what's exciting about July 4th? July 4th is July 4th. We're in Botswana. What is July 4th? July 4th is just another day I've got to go to work. You see, but people in Botswana, they don't know what July 4th is. Now, we in America, we know exactly what July 4th is. And as soon as I say July 4th, we all think, wow, and I'm not even born an American. July 4th is in, the, you guys, 530, we're going to work together on this, okay? We're keeping each other awake, all right? This is the same thing. Let the reader understand. The Gentiles had no idea what the abomination of desolation was. And so Mark says you need to know what it is. The abomination of desolation is at the three and a half year mark, after the temple of God has been rebuilt, the Antichrist, this man, he will walk into the temple, he will sit down on the throne of God, and he will tell the world, worship me. Worship me. This now says the next three and a half years of tribu a great tribulation is about to happen. And when this happens, I want you to see what Jesus tells the Jews to do. He says, verse 15, let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak, verse 17, and alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. Jesus says, as soon as that man sits down on that throne at the three and a half year mark, Jews, get out of Jerusalem. It's going to be worse than World War II. There's going to be more than 6 million Jews that he will slaughter. There is going to be a massive holocaust. And Jesus is giving practical advice. And he's saying in the middle of that seven years, get out of Jerusalem. Don't even go back to your house. Run away because I'm going to supernaturally protect you. And he says to them, get out of there. Tribulation. No the great tribulation is upon the world. But God is merciful. And in verse 20, Jesus tells us, and if the Lord had not cut short the days, in other words, if he only didn't cut it at three and a half years, no human being would be saved. See, God is merciful. He's so merciful that he cuts short his wrath because if he continued pouring out his bowl upon the world, not one human being would be alive. The Bible then goes on in verse 21 and he says this, and then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, don't believe it. 
For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But, here's the warning again, be on your guard. Be watching in holiness. I have, underlined this, told you all things beforehand. I need to let you know something. The devil has a bag of tricks. And they're supernatural. The devil has a bag of tricks. And for some reason, in God's economy, he's allowed the enemy to be powerful. So powerful, he can do signs and wonders. Let me tell you what happens. At the three and a half year mark, the Antichrist is killed. Now, some theologians believe that he's actually shot in the head. And the Bible says that the false prophet raises him from the dead. And all of the world sees this and goes, we should worship him. And he goes and he sits down on the throne of God and the world goes, we should worship him. And Jesus says, get out of Jerusalem. See, the devil, he's got a bag of tricks. And Christian, let me tell you something. Jesus said to his disciples, a wicked and perverse generation look for signs. We can't look for signs for our answer. Jesus says, I have told you. We've got to rely on the word of God. We can't rely on signs and experiences. No, Jesus says, you're not going to know them by signs. You're going to know them by their fruits. Are they loving? Are they joyful? Are they kind? Are they gentle? Are they long-suffering? Do they exhibit the fruit of the Spirit? Don't look to signs. Look to fruit. And let me tell you why. Because the only thing that they're going to have to stand on during this seven years is the same thing I pray is the only thing that we stand on. I have told you the Word of God. The mighty warrior of heaven you see these days the only thing they're going to have to stand on is the word because jesus he makes it clear look how horrible these days are in verse 24 in those days after the tribulation the sun will be darkened the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven jesus is saying if you don't believe in the light of the world then i'm gonna darken the world And if you want to worship these stars, well, here they are. And the bold judgments begin to fall. And the Bible says, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. If you want to worship Mother Earth, watch her shake. And look at the great news of verse 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. This is the moment of the end of the tribulation, at the end of the seven years where we saw that Jesus returns. And then at the end of that great tribulation, what we read in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus is going to return. And guess who he returns with? The church. Remember, we were raptured. And we get to come back with Jesus. It's going to be so cool. And we're going to look what's going to happen. Look what we get to do. In verse 27. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. All of the people that have survived the seven-year tribulation, that believe in Jesus, theologically we call them tribulation saints. Now let me tell you something about these tribulation saints. It's going to be rough. Because they're not going to want the mark of the beast. And they're not going to take their hand and scan it at Ralph's so that they can buy food. And they're not going to put the mark of the beast on their head so that when they want to fly somewhere, they just put their head up on the scanner and they're able to get on the airplane. You see, it's going to be rough for these guys. And that's why I'm begging you, don't wait until this time to be a tribulation saint. Now truly, yes, Jesus is going to come and rescue his tribulation saints. It's his heart for this period of time. This is not necessarily the wrath of God. God is doing everything and anything he can to get the world's attention. I love you. My son is coming. I'm blowing the trumpet. I'm pouring out the bold judgments. I want you to know that I'm coming and I want you to be saved. And so, the Bible says that we will come with Jesus riding behind him on that horse. And it's incredible. 
all of the armies of the world are going to be gathering. It's called Armageddon. And they're going to be gathering to fight Jesus. And you know what Jesus says? You're done. That's it. The Bible says he speaks a word and they're done. I'm kind of disappointed. I was hoping like have a little sword fight or something like that. But guess what happens after this? The millennial kingdom. And because you've accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, the Bible says that we will rule and reign with Jesus. So we get to rule and reign over the tribulation saints. So let me tell you, I've been asking Jesus to give me New Zealand. I'm hoping for the, na for the nation of New Zealand. I like the mountains, I like the surf, and I'm asking God, would you just please let me be the governor of New Zealand? Because here's the deal, I will go out in the water, I won't even need a surfboard, walking on water, dude, that's going to be what's going to happen. And a great white is going to swim right up to me, and I'm going to look at him and go, <laughs> Millennial Kingdom, you can't eat me. You know, it's one of those incredible moments where I'm going to be able to have this conversation with this great white, and he's going to go, oh, you remember when I used to eat people? <laughs> Don't do that anymore. You know, it's just one of those things, like it's, you know, it, I can't wait for this moment because we will rule and reign with Christ. I told you I had some good news and I had some bad news. And because Jesus is such a great teacher, he closes out this section. He closes it out with two stories. And I want you to see what he says. From the tree, fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Jesus, he, he spoke in stories. And so what he's saying is, okay, look at the fig tree. You know when you see the branches coming that the tree is starting to have the sap come in it and it's moving from a twig to a supple branch where a fig will be able to grow on it. And you look at this and you know, oh, summer's coming. And what Jesus is saying, would you take a look at the next verse? He explains it. So also, when you see these things, everything that I've just mentioned taking place, you know that he's near. He's at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away. That seven-year period will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away but my word will not pass away. I don't want you to look at your circumstance. I don't want you to look at your experience. I'm telling you there's going to be seven years of tribulation, and I'm telling you that I'm coming again. And I'm telling you, when he sets on the throne, there'll be only three and a half years. Wait, endure to the end. I'm telling you, and it's true, because I am God, and I am telling you. And he's saying, be on your guard. I want you to watch with holiness. But concerning that day, Jesus says, or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know, the t know when the time will come. Jesus is constantly reiterating, I want you to be watchful. I want you to be preparing. He says, I'm the son, and I don't even know that time. Now, some of you should have a problem with that. How can Jesus, who is God, not know something? This verse is the evidence of his humanity. This verse is the evidence that he chose to lay aside his deity and be fully God and fully man. Because he refers to himself as the son. He knows he's the son of God. But he has let this portion of his divinity be laid aside so that he could experience everything as a man. Now remember I told you in Acts chapter 1, in his resurrected body, when the disciples ask him the same question, he says, this is not for you to know. In other words, in his resurrected body in Acts chapter 1, he now knows because he's the eternal God-man. And so this is an evidence of his humanity and an evidence of his divinity. And he says, be on your guard by knowing my word. But I told you there were two stories, and here's where we close. Verse 34, it's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, underline this, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. 
Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. There's our second point. You see, the second point is told with the second story. He says, I want you, as you wait for my coming, to be working. Don't just sit down and go, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, praise the Lord, Jesus is coming. No, 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 that's not what he wants us to do. He says, I want to find you working. In fact, Jesus, in one of the earlier Gospels, he says this, do business until I come. Now, what's the business of Jesus? We don't have to ask that question. He said this, go into all the nations and preach the gospel. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. I don't need to wonder what's the business of Jesus. I don't want anyone to go through this seven-year period. And I was so blessed yesterday, I'm walking out of Ralph's, and one of our staff members is speaking to a homeless couple giving them Jesus. And I sat there, and he doesn't even know I watched him. I sat there and I watched him doing the business of Jesus. I was overwhelmed. He's preaching the gospel. But I also know he's investing into young people. He's making disciples. And he will not be found not watchful. He will not be found not working. No, he's engaged in the business of Jesus. And so Jesus says this, he says it to everyone sitting here, stay awake, all of us, be watchful, and be working. I'm coming again. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm so grateful you're coming, so excited that one day that last trumpet for the church will sound, we will meet you in the air. I'm looking forward to a glorified body. No more creaks and cracks. Just you for eternity. And so, Lord, would you make us watchful? Lord, would you convict us to be working, doing your business? You're coming again. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? Church, this is a time that we sing and reflect. And so as we sing this song, I believe, reflect on the fact that he's coming. Reflect on the fact to be working and to be watching. Let's sing the song with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. So much so, maybe we even sound louder than the sound. Amen.
God has tested like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain beyond the horizon. With mercy for today, faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me. And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you. Clothing me in white. Bringing beauty from ashes. You have your bride. service where we just stop for a minute and we say la we think and pause and reflect and you've had two weeks to remember our last scripture two weeks and I know all of you guys have memorized it so much trust have we in you it'll be on the screen behind me <laughs> mark chapter 12 would you say it from memory with me and you love the Lord 
with all your, with all your, and so proud of you guys. You're unbelievable. And this week, Mark chapter 13, verse 31, would you say it with me? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Let's commit that to memory as we are watchful in holiness and working with godliness. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Have a great week.